Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise, of course, with your leave to make a contribution on the bill, shortly entitled the Senator Increase in Numbers Bill 2012, Mr. Speaker. And I do so bearing in mind late at night, perhaps nonetheless, there are many who are listening, and I want in particular to say how extraordinary a privilege and tremendous honor it is for me to speak at this moment to all the people of the country on such a very important bill, the Senator's Increase of Numbers Bill 2012. But I'm even more delighted to speak, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the beloved constituents of Bellevue, Tabernacle, Mansion, Christchurch, Molyneux, Phillips, Borio, Lodge Village, Lodge Portrait, and Otley's 10 District. Mr. Speaker, as a responsible representative, I have consulted with my beloved constituents and I have given them the opportunity to express their views with regard to the need for the bill which we are now debating. And I'm happy to say that my position is in lockstep with the overwhelming majority of my constituents, some of whom are here in the chamber. And as a matter of fact, it is in their express, passionate, contextual framework that I would like to make my contribution with your permission. Mr. Speaker, a lot has been said about the bill. And indeed, since its introduction last year, this bill has stirred a disquiet among the people of the country for many reasons. Some of them have been expounded already in the House. Mr. Speaker, the record will show that I have on every occasion where this matter has been discussed, expressed without reservation my strong, my strong opposition to the bill being read at this particular moment in time. I have done so to my cabinet colleagues, I've done so to the members of the National Executive of the party, I have done so with my constituents who sent me here. I have done so on every occasion because in my humble opinion, the timing of this bill is definitely wrong. The bill, in my view, humbly so and respectfully so, is out of sync with too many things, Mr. Speaker. And I would have preferred, honestly, that the first sitting of the Honorable <coughs> House in the year of the Lord 2013 would see to address issues of more fundamental importance to the upliftment of ordinary poor people in St. Kitts and Nevis. I consider it a distraction in the face of the overwhelming challenges which ordinary people everywhere are facing that the very first meeting in the new year we should be as it were tarrying all day, tarrying with regard to finding place and positions for three unelected people to come in the parliament. I find that, Mr. Speaker, to be a distraction. I find it to be unnecessary, and I find it respectfully to be not in keeping with the best expectations of the people who I represent and the people in the country at large. I am sure that all of us have heard from time to night, from time to time, 
the stories of parents and children, men and women, old and young who wake up in the mornings without any idea how they will make it through the day, where the proper meal will come from. I am sure that we know that there are people amongst us who go to sleep at night with no clue how tomorrow they will pay their electricity and their water bill. They have no clue how they will make it, Mr. Speaker, to pay the loan that is long overdue. And it is in the face of the cries of help from our people that I consider this particular bit of legislation to be a distraction. A distraction, Mr. Speaker, for us dealing with the real issues of the people and their demands for relief. For me as a parliamentary rep, I deal with those calamities every day. And I feel for the regular people. I am thankful that from time to time I have been able to do little and to give little in the face of the real needs that they have. These needs, Mr. Speaker, have to be fulfilled. And it is a responsibility of a caring government to deal with those realities and the harshness and the hardness of times. And yes, Mr. Speaker, none will counter say that the global economic financial recession has had its impact on us, and it has had its impact all over the world. <clears throat> and yet equally, none will gain say that domestic policies adopted before the recession, during the recession, have also created the hardships which we are now attempting to deal with. Wherever we ascribe the triggers to the crisis to, whether they be foreign or domestic, we cannot escape the reality that it is hard times out there. It is hard times for all of us, <coughs> hard times for me, hard times for labor people, hard times for PAM people, hard times for NRP people, hard times for CCM people, and hard times for non-aligned people too. All of us are feeling it, and all of us are wanting for some relief. Right now, Mr. Speaker, as I make this contribution, <coughs> I feel for the young lady who be me earlier with concern that her electricity and water have been disconnected. And I know tomorrow I have to find something, however small, to help that young lady and to help relieve her not just from the fear, but the shame of the darkness that has crept over this household. <coughs> and so as we debate this bill about senators, as we propose to add thousands of dollars to the federal budget, unnecessarily so, I want to spare a thought for those persons who have been told that the economic hardship will lead them into getting less work because their operations, their companies are covered. <coughs> Serious issues affecting the country. Serious issues which must enjoy all of us. All of us. Because we are in a crisis. A crisis a difficult period in our country, and there is no Solomonic wisdom on this side of the house or on the other side of the house. There is a need for all men and women of goodwill to come together in serious business of consultation, and consultation that would lead to meaningful action so that we can inspire hope and confidence again in our people first and foremost and set our federation to work again for our people. That is what is required. 
a call for unity at this time, a call for people of goodwill, people with ideas, people with compassion to come together because our country needs us now more than ever. And each of us could take up the song, I vow to thee my country, this country that I love, that is what we need now in our country. For us to be able to say that and mean that and act on that, that is what out there, that is what people are wanting. And no amount of Shakespearean stories, no amount of personal abuse, no amount of a lot of child's play will change the reality of our country unless we get serious about the real problems affecting us. It can't be our first priority for the new year. Give me to me. It can't be. It can't be to get a deputy speaker. Give me to me. It can't be. What happened to the hundreds of people who are out there? What happens to the elder lady in Molly News, who because she got a little break, she was turned away from assistance? We can't help you because you have a job. And what is the job? A menial job. But yet we are restructuring. Those are the people's reality and the legislative agenda of this government of which I am a part. This government must reflect a people's agenda first and foremost because people matter most. And I have a duty of care and I have a responsibility to advise my government to warn my government, to tell my government, because I help put it there. And the people of number seven are a critical part of this government being here. I have a responsibility to speak with their voice, to speak their pain, to speak their preference, to speak to their expectations and aspirations. And tonight I stand in their day, and I do so. And I do so with a thick conscience. And I do so for love of the people of Bellevue who have stood with me time and time again. And many times I have been undeserving, but they look beyond my fault, and they see me for what I am, a young poor man from Tabernacle Village, who grew up around them, who stood grounded with them to thick and thin man, who prepared myself for such a time like these, never wavered in compassion, in understanding, in advocacy on their behalf. Whatever the lot may be, somebody taught me to say at the end of it, Tim, it will be well with your soul once you represent those people well. And that is why they will never let you go. That is why they are here, standing solidly as a rock. And that is why I have no fear in doing the right thing for those people who have always showed me love. And who in the spirit of love, I reciprocate. And I make this contribution on their behalf. But dear day is not unique to the picturesque community of Bellevue Waters. Their pain and their pressures are universal in the country. It is the same pain I hear in George Street. It's the same pain I hear in Birdwalk. It is the same pain you hear in West. It's the same pain I hear from my relatives in Cotton Brown and Ramsbury Nevis. 
It is the same pain. Somebody did a good song. Hmm? The Trinidad all over. Calypsonian says. What was the song? This thing ain't on the boundaries. Poverty and sorrow ain't on the boundaries. It ain't of that. It ain't none of that. So it is there. It is real. And no matter how much we try to close it up, it reveals itself. It reveals itself every day. <coughs> when somebody's life is being cut, and they can't see the way of dealing with it. It reveals itself when workers laid off at Clear Harbor almost two, three years, still can't find work in a contracting economy. It reveals itself, man. It reveals itself when the mother can't pay the small amount in charge of our daycare centers. Because that is all. It reveals itself when the young lady in mansion or tabernacle can't see it to pay their buses to take them to the workplace. It reveals itself when workers are at home and no holiday has been paid yet to them and they are fighting a boss who has all the power and no action for them. Some of them have worked 20 years in an entity and suddenly they've gone home, either the line changed or something else happened. And they go to see a dress. But nobody answers. Nobody understands the urgency of poverty. Nobody seems to care anymore that you have to stand up for the poor that you have to be up there breathing action against oppressive employers of the ordinary people who have no heart that after 20 days they ask you to leave and you get nothing in return. These are the realities that I would have preferred that in our first meeting of parliament that we were addressing real people's issues the lived experience of our people. Those are what the first debate really should have been about. And so I am engaged <coughs> reluctantly in this debate. Reluctantly. Because I pleaded time and time again, this bill was not important. And we hear a lot of talk about dying on the hill. When you listen to this bill, and the rational and the reason for this bill, is this a reason, an urgent reason, to have us in the parliament? It is not. Truth be told, it is not. It is a minor matter in the sequence of the lived reality of ordinary people. And somebody must be brave enough to speak that basic truth. And say, as one brave person said, if I perish in speaking truth to power, I perish. I perish, man. But truth must be spoken. Truth must be spoken. And that is what we are attempting to do, Mr. Speaker. That is what it is, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the arguments put are not convincing for ordinary folks. Maybe for smart, smart people, they are convinced that you are for sitting of parliament, you will be detained about consideration for three persons. In the context of the reality for us out there, Three persons detaining us. That is what it is. Three persons. Oh. It is a conversation we need not have. You have heard the arguments. If we were more judicious in the choosing of our senators, if 
very things we are attempting to achieve now would have achieved then, as a member for number three said. But is it by some revelation that we now recognize we need a deputy speaker? Truth is, we knew, and we had one, and we said it was not necessary. Therefore, he resigned within 24 hours. Truth is truth. We said it. We said it to the country and to the people. We made the point, convincing even those of us who felt otherwise, like the leader of government business who stood in the chamber and spoke about that, having regard to the position expressing solution. No matter with that, the House is properly constituted. So we come back three years after, three years after, to a matter then that had been settled. And when you say to your colleagues, this is not necessary, somebody then say, man, you're a traitor. When you speak truth, when you speak your conscience, when you say we are making a misstep, well, if that is what it is, then I am prepared still to speak the truth, still to say that it is wrong, still to say that we are misstep, making a misstep in relation to this bill. I'm saying that. I have consistently said that, and I believe it. Arguments, however put, however romanticized in terms of democracy, we know it, we feel it, we lived it, and so we can speak to it. And when we have doubt, we look for reference elsewhere. And the move of the bill, yes, attempted to take us elsewhere to look, for example, for guidance, for reference. He, for example, took us to look at the Ugandan model. Ugandan model, Africa, the continent, the motherland. But you Google Uganda, and you begin to wonder whether that really is the reference point we want in the development of our democracy, you wonder aloud because something has sound right about it. And so I too did a little research. A little research. Uganda final report, general elections, 18 February 2011, date the 10th March, European Union observation mission. Hear what it says about Uganda. Overall conclusion. I'm reading at page 5 of 46 by my print. Somebody may have larger or smaller print and the page may have changed, Mr. Speaker. But I read. The 2011 Ugandan general elections showed some improvements over the previous elections held in 2006. However, the electoral process was marred by avoidable administrative and logistical failures, which led to an unacceptable number of Ugandan citizens being disenfranchised. Oh, Lord. Ah. An unacceptable number of Ugandan citizens being disenfranchised. And they went to tell us more, furthermore, the power of incumbency was exercised to such an extent as to compromise severely, the severely the level playing field between the competing candidates and the political parties. And he go on to talk about the violence and intimidation, especially on election day, the electoral campaign, and the polling day activity. Then we hear also that in those countries we have issues and they attempted to do some good things. Women in parliament and so on, and special interest. Mm -hmm. 
And, <laughs> and <laughs> yes, we go in there. We go in there. We're talking about the model because that process deals with election. And so in the end, it deals with the validity of who gets into the parliament. That is the point. The whole link. He said, indirect special interest group constitute a breach of equality of vote, particularly since in all but one case, there is no clear justification for giving particular advantage this to the group and so on. In other words, you could pick and choose. You could pick and choose who you are going to be in. And the reason, according to the observers, don't fly. They don't accept them. And they said, while positive discrimination of persons with disabilities may be justified in the case of workers and youths, these measures are unnecessary. While those for the armed forces are particularly problematic since the military MPs are not accountable to a constituency. Well, we have a constituency system here. That is an important difference. And in our system, as far as I understand it, I believe military people of that sort, like pastors, they are not eligible to be in our parliament. So the Ugandan reference point really don't sit here nice according to the observers and it don't seem to fit nice in terms of our tradition and so on. That in itself doesn't really mean that there is no good values which we can learn. There obviously may be some sort of things in the system. But we go back again. Because one of the points the move was trying to make, you see in Uganda the guard in the top. They're bringing in more and more people. That is the whole idea about reform. Well, hear what the observers say. All members of parliament, including any quota seats, that is to say we need certain number of women and disadvantaged people and military people, they say they should be elected, elected by direct and universal suffrage. What the Ugandans are saying, with all of that, the observer team are saying, at the heart of democracy, it is the preponderance, it is the membership in the decision-making and legislative body of elected people as member number three was proposing. They're not a talk about no senator. They're not a talk about no unelected people in the House. They are saying that the reform agenda must address that. And if all of these groups have an interest, let them come in. Let them face the people. Let the people make their choice. Let them be elected directly and by universal suffrage. A big term mean regular people of a defined age, irrespective of color, creed, race, and persuasion, must have a right to make the choice. That is the contention of the member for number three. That is it. That is the heart of the matter. It leads, obviously, to the delusion of the impact of the voice of the true representative of the people. That is what 1952 henceforth was about. It was about I choose. It was about ending the special place of people, of business, of color, of greed, of influence, making the choice and getting into the parliament. That is what it was about. And once that had been achieved, that is why there was no effort to all those times for people to try to go back to ferments, okay? Go back to increase the number of unelected people. And what basis? And what basis? It didn't work then. That is why we progress beyond it. It didn't work. It didn't work, Mr. Speaker. This, Mr. Speaker, 
is an important argument which some people wanted to downplay. Not necessary to downplay. The references themselves made the case in relation to that particular matter. The other areas that people have put up, the complexity issue that has been exhaustively addressed. Because really, what it is the senators going to do that can change complexity? And how do we expand in this climate of austerity, this climate of an IMF program which says to us, cause containment, and a critical platform of the IMF program is that wages in our country and salaries are too high, so contain them. And it is a result of that policy that you had to put the fees and increment. It was as a result of that policy that you had to put a fees and posts. So tell me if this is congruent. And one hand you say, to get us out of the trouble in which we are in, we need to put a fees and personal emoluments because they are too high as a percentage of the revenue of the country. And yet, three people are going to make us break that. Three people. <laughs> they must be very special people. They must be very important people. So that in the face of all these realities, we are so consumed in getting three new people for 2013 that nothing else matter. <clears throat> nothing else matter. Historical friendships and relationships doesn't matter anymore because I need to get three. Whatever is the magic in three, I really don't know whether they are wise men or otherwise. And if they are wise men, will they be coming from the east or northeast? Or will they be coming from the West? From whence will the wise men came to take our country forward? What will be the critical tests and criteria that undergo the selection of these three wise people? Whom we must pay a salary and we must pay all the work receipts. Their, their big jobs are already I am sure. Will come passing through in the new suit. I gather some of them don't buy a suit already. <laughs> you understand that? Are we really understanding where we are at? Are we really understanding the challenges which we are confronting? And how we are trying to keep our government and our country on course? On course. But that really can't accord with the overwhelming <coughs> sense of history which we must have. Somebody made reference to it. The reality in St. Kitts and Neve is for what it's worth. And we could speak this truth. People really like unelected people. They really like them. <coughs> really are a R-E-L-Y. They don't like unelected people. That is our reality. Generally, generally, they often ask, how them go on so? Who give them all that power? Why are they behaving so in the parliament? Why are they cutting costs for the people? How come they get so arrogant? We know the reality. Indeed, it was we from this party who took an objection to it too. If truth be told, we said massacres had too much power. We said it. We said unelected people should not come in the government and have more power than elected people. And I believe we were right. I believe we were right. So not that I'm saying anything was wrong with that particular social. The principles in relation to it, Mr. Speaker. That is what it is about, Mr. Speaker. We know it. We know it, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our people want the elected members of parliament 
to be respected as their genuine voice in Parliament. That is why they put us here. They want us to speak for them. We represent the legitimate voices of the people and to bring more elect, unelected members in this honorable house, in my view, at this particular moment of time when we can least afford it. We can least afford it. <coughs> we know in 2013 we must begin to make payment to the IMF and the $224 million approximately in loans made available to us. We know that in 2014 it is principal and interest that has to be repaid. So we are going to have a burgeoning of the cars. This is not the right time, obviously, for that. It is not the right time. People need a little need, a little help. And this bill, in my view, is going to be hurtful. Because no matter how you twist it, no matter how you turn it, the truth is all expenditures of the government will ultimately be made by the people. Whether you pay it in VAT, or you pay it in electricity, or you pay it up at the hospital and your prescriptions, it is the people, the taxpayers of the country, who <coughs> has to in the end, pay for all these expenses. And we are saying at this particular moment in time, the people really can't take on that at this time. These three other persons, not necessary. Not necessary in my view. Not necessary in the view of the people out there who can't find work. Not necessary for the student out there who is back in a contracting economy of the last 40 years, who has his or her student loan to pay, and no job at TDC, no job at Hosford, no job at Cable and Wireless, no job in the government, because positions are frozen. Positions are frozen at this time. Understand? That is what we are talking about. Staying on course. Making government work for the people, not work against the people. That is what we are saying. That is our opposition to it. That is our opposition to it. That is what it is about. It is not right at this time. It is not necessary. So it is wrong time. It is wrong in substance. And indeed, it is wrong in the symbolism because it represents a disconnect, a serious disconnect between the electors and the people they have put in parliament to do their business. And there are alternatives. For me, it doesn't matter if it is one. I gather it's only one body we may absolutely need for our deputy speaker. But for me, even if it is one, I oppose to it. I oppose to it on substance. And I oppose it on the symbolism that is this particular time in our history. It shouldn't be about adding more. It shouldn't be about that, Mr. Speaker. It is unnecessary. And then, there are other more useful things. If it is... $10,000, I would prefer, because we have an ad now about a, 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 a young child with a brain tumor needing 15,000 US dollars to go and get surgery, corrective surgery. I would prefer, instead of one senator costing us this money, we make a grant to that family to help them take the child abroad. They are up and down worrying to get 15,000 US dollars. I believe the country would see us as being more compassionate and caring if we were to use the money that way. I believe if we were to find some space by some magic of arithmetic or convenience, we must use that to find that poor lady in McKnight, in Newton Brown, in Tabernacle, in Phillips, well, poor person, 
whoever he or she may be. And let us give them some real assistance. I believe if we could buy money for three persons, I would prefer we don't use the money that way. That is my preference. I must be free to express that preference. We talk about the Constitution. Freedom is what the Constitution gives us to speak. And you are saying that you can't speak about your preference as a citizen and as a member of the parliament. I am not here in my own right. I am here representing the people. And in this house, they must hear me genuinely expressing their views, their sentiments. If we have extra monies, whether it is 118 or 200, it doesn't really matter. And somebody says, the parliament may go for another two years or five years, I don't know. It really doesn't matter because if God be for me, I'm going to be back here. But I will prefer that the money be spent, for example, repairing the roof of the Mary Charles Hospital, yes, long yes. being damaged. Yes, yes, if there is money to be found, there are much more useful purposes. Mm -hmm. I will prefer if money be found, that the poor people at Eskridge Housing in Mansion who want to get lights on their street lamps, that those things be attended to letters after letters have not bought results for the people of Mansion. And I'm sure there are the areas. But I am the representative for the people. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have a right to bring their case and let them know that I've done my job. Letters after letters in relation to this. To the chairman of NHC, to the minister, and even higher. So when people tell me that there is no money, to we can see what we can do. And I see it look like money can be found. What is my duty and responsibility? Not to say remember what you have forgotten to do. Am I being unreasonable for being an excellent representative for the people? Am I being unreasonable to speak to my conscience a fundamental right of man, a fundamental principle governing the dignity of a person was that a man or woman must be allowed to speak their conscience. Nobody, no one has no right or no power to use duress or any other mechanism or instrument to force people to go against their conscience. Yes, if there are monies to be found, I don't know. I would prefer to see the money spent at the school meals, facility at Needmos, doing renovations. Yes, if there are monies to be found, I would like to see the brand new public market for our farmers being built. I don't have a problem. I have a problem with the potholes in Owen Street and Thomas Street in Molyneux and Molyneux Extension. And I have a problem when after many years, the people of Kidnally Lodge, their roads can't be paid and resurface. I have a problem in facing Tessa Mitchum in Lodge Village to say, Tessa, your road can't be done. When Tessa asks me, how is it you all finding money for three more people? and nobody put them there. Why you want more than people for? When I see how them are going, I saw Tessa talk to me. And I have to sit down and Tessa step and listen to Tessa and understand, despite the fact that she bored in me hard, Tessa may have a real concern. And the real concern is the words, Mr. Speaker. That, Mr. Speaker, is part of the issues that we are talking about, Mr. Speaker. Alternative uses, better uses of the people's money, Mr. Speaker. We can do better. We can do better for this country. We can do better for all of our people. We can do better. 
Just give it a thought. Just listen to reasonableness. Because the position we are taking is not unreasonable. We represent people. We have to deal with that conflict between their expectations, their needs. We have to reconcile that with the realities of the government. So we have to tell them when things are tight, things are tight, so certain things can't be done. But when we tell them that and we convince them, and they see other realities, they begin to ask us serious and reasonable questions. Such as the one that Tessa asks me every time I go to you. Tessa, I'm not calling your name for no harm. It is important, Mr. Speaker, that people get a real understanding, really, of what it is this is about. And to go back again to the bill, we are told that since 1937 or 52, we've always had not more than two senators or nominated members of the Senate. That's a very long time. You mean that between 1952 and now, the complexity of the government never changed? You mean nobody else had it hard in the 1970s when we had oil crisis and food crisis? When we had the ushering of a new agenda and philosophy of government and governance in the USA? in 1980, and Margaret Thatcher. Nobody recognized that boy, we need to break this tradition of balance. And when they recognized that they needed more help in the people's parliament, they said, let us increase the number of elected people. We want in our parliament to hear the genuine voice of the people express to their representative. And so today we come to change protocol according to our parliamentary practices. We come without, as it were, an appreciation for the history of parliamentary life. And we say in 2013, let us change it. 100% of the way. And we will change it because we could laugh off the cars. It's small. Well, the light bill for people who are being caught may be that small, but this money could cover it. This money can cover it. The problems which people are experiencing, remind me, my friend, the Honorable Senator, the signage at the school in Tabernacle, I had used your name with your acknowledgement to get the signage. Remember the Tabernacle School that is broken? You were to talk with it. That guy. Yes. 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 That too, I understand, and I know you work. If it's just, as it came to me, giving you a gentle when reminder. Time, when the time is right. That is true. That. So, Mr. I'm Speaker. I'm not here to do that. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, I mean, that point, that the bill, Mr. Speaker, is out of time. It is not, it represents a disconnect with our people and it sends the wrong signal for people at this particular moment <coughs> in time. I don't want to get into all the other debates and arguments, because we have heard about who is responsible for the deputy speaker and all of these things. I will just commend the host to the views of Professor, professor Rosemary Anthony. She's a professor of law. And when they call themselves professor, they're supposed to know something about what they are talking. And the professor says, it is the ruling party 
It is the ruling party that determines when it is convenient for Parliament to sit. So indirectly, it assumes the responsibility that Parliament be properly constituted, properly constituted so as to have the legitimacy to sit as requested. She was in this article debunking the argument that it was a responsibility of the opposition to accept the deputy speakership. She said, no way. That's way, you know. She said, no way that could pass in law. She said, no judge, no here would accept that argument. And she was making the points about what a deputy speaker is, and so on, and so on, and so on. And she said, the same way you needed to get him elected to go, that position had to stand. And that as soon as a vacancy became, it was a governmental responsibility to build. And she, in simple terms, also explained what soon as it's convenient. She said soon as it's convenient in relation to parliament means the next available sitting and no time later. That is what's her view. A prominent, respected attorney of law, yes, professor, yeah. international consultant. Yeah. That was her view and the matter. Disagree. But then I am no lawyer, I am just a reader of these things, and I try to garner an understanding of this thing. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I want to extend the word of gratitude to the many persons who have comforted me, who have said prayers, who have stood by me and encouraged me <laughs> to be brave, to be strong. Mm. Oh, I never invited this, Mr. Speaker, this particular moment. I would not have wanted to be Mr. Speaker in Juve. And a young man come up the village come to tell me that I am going to be totally destroyed. I don't have to call the name of the man because the man has been in trouble before and it may not be good, right? The young man came to tell me that I will be totally destroyed. I want for the record to say to the people that I've made a complaint to the police and I'm awaiting their investigation in it. I'm waiting on it. But it is a serious charge to be made by that particular individual. But I am not going to live my life in fear. It is a democracy that we want to build in Saints and Nevis, and people must be free to choose. <laughs> people must be free to choose. You don't have to agree with people's choices, because I can't agree with many of his choices. How dare he comes in the presence of witnesses to threaten me. It shows the level of cannibalism and tribalism and criminality that has been touted in our society today. Okay. And responsible people ought to take note that this is not a time for joke. This is a time when there are agents directly confronting people aided and abetted. And in the midst of all of those things, I remain a free man. <coughs> Understand? Witnesses and the bold enough to tell you all man of things, <coughs> witnesses to see you're not troubling the man. He comes to tell me who his boss is and what he and his boss will do to me. And I endure all of those things. He told me if I thought what was done to a certain politician at Marriott was bad, wait till they finish with me. It is duress. That is what is happening. Understand? 
And people are going through these things. Nobody in the 21st century can send it to Nevis. If we are truthful and honest about practicing democracy, or to support.